The Hindenburg class airship was a rigid airship that flew between 1936 and 1939. Two airships in the Hindenburg class were built, the LZ-129 Hindenburg and the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin II. They remain the largest man-made object to fly as of 2019. This article will not cover the airship story since this is already widely known. Rather it will cover the technical aspects of the Hindenburg class airship. Design and Development The basic design of LZ-129 Hindenburg was conventional, and based on time-tested technology used by chief designer Ludwig Dürr and the Zeppelin company for decades. The ship was built with riveted, triangular, duralium and girders, painted bright blue with protective lacquer, forming 15 main rings connecting 36 longitudinal girders, with a triangular keel at the bottom of the hull, an axial corridor at the center of the ship, and a cruciform tail for strength. The Hindenburg's main rings were numbered by their distance in meters from a reference point located roughly at the ship's tail. Hindenburg's gas cells were numbered from 1 through 16, aft to forward respectively. One important technological advance was the ship's very shape and dimensions, although only about 30 feet longer than the LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin, the Hindenburg carried about twice the volume of lifting gas, due to its larger diameter and fatter profile. Hindenburg's thicker shape also gave it greater structural strength against bending stresses, as compared to the thinner profile of Graf Zeppelin. After construction was complete, the LZ-129 was 245 meters or 803 feet and 10 inches long, often rounded up to 804 feet, and was 41 meters in diameter at its widest point. It had an uninflated empty weight of 130,000 kilograms, and a total fuel weight of 65,000 kilograms. The LZ-129 used a new material for the construction of the gas cells. While gas cells for earlier German Zeppelins were made of gold beater's skin. The outer membrane of cattle intestines. The cells aboard Hindenburg used a new material, which was made by brushing layers of gelatin onto a sheet of cotton. This gelatin film was sandwiched between two layers of cotton to create the fabric for the cells. Hindenburg's gas cells had 14 manually controlled maneuvering valves located just above the axial walkway, which could be operated from the main gas board in the control car. Electric meters measured the amount of lifting gas in each cell and could be monitored in the control car. Hindenburg was also equipped with 14 automatic valves which released gas whenever cell pressure became too high to avoid damage to the cells themselves or to the framework of the ship as either heat from the sun or flying to higher altitudes will cause the lifting gas to expand. Hindenburg's low cruising altitude also provided passengers with spectacular views. The Hindenburg had a maximum lifting gas capacity of 200,000 cubic meters and could lift almost 232,000 kilograms of useful payload. The Hindenburg's outer cover was made of cotton and laced directly onto the airship's framework. A protective dope composed of iron oxide, cellulose acetate butyrate, and aluminum powder, was brushed onto the airship's covering to provide it with protection from ultraviolet and infrared radiation as well as to tighten the cotton covering over the framework and provide a water seal. Propulsion The Hindenburg used four Daimler Benz engines based on the MB502 engine designed for German high-speed motor torpedo boats. Each of Hindenburg's four DB602 16-cylinder engines had a maximum output of 1,320 horsepower at 1,650 rpm. However, the normal cruise setting was 1,350 rpm, generating approximately 850 horsepower, and this setting was usually not adjusted during an ocean crossing. The engines were started with compressed air and could be started, stopped, and reversed in flight. Using 2 to 1 reduction gearing, each engine drove a four-blade, fixed-pitch, 19.7-foot diameter, metal-sheathed, wooden propeller created from two, two-blade propellers fused together. The engines were mounted in four engine cars, two at ring 92, and two at ring 140. To protect the ship's fabric covering, the engines were angled slightly away from the hull so that their propeller wash would not directly strike the ship's covering. The rear engine cars were mounted lower on the hull than the forward cars, so that the propellers of the rear cars would operate in clean air, undisturbed by the prop wash from the forward engines. A mechanic was always stationed in each engine car to monitor its 16-cylinder diesel and carry out engine orders transmitted from the control car. There were plans, though never implemented, to add a fifth engine car, containing a Daimler-Benz diesel adapted to burn hydrogen. The proposed installation would have been an experiment to improve the ship's economy and efficiency by burning hydrogen which would otherwise have been valved. The Hindenburg class airship had a maximum speed of 135 km an hour but usually cruised at 125 km an hour. Operations 
Hindenburg, like all large rigid airships, was not piloted like an airplane or a blimp, but commanded like an ocean-going vessel. Flying the Hindenburg was a complex operation which required the coordinated efforts of many individuals to operate and maintain the airship, monitor and respond to the weather, and navigate across long distances. The ship was flown by a minimum flight crew of 39 officers and men, not including passenger service personnel such as cooks and stewards, under the command of the captain. In addition to the flight crew, the ship's passengers were served by a chief steward, a chief cook, and 10 to 12 stewards and assistant cooks. Hindenburg also began carrying a doctor in 1937. The Hindenburg could be controlled from two locations within the airship. The first of course being the forward control car, located near the front of the airship at ring 203, while the second was a control center in the forward section of the lower rudder fin at the rear of the airship. However, this was only meant to be used in case the controls in the main control car malfunctioned. The control car was divided into three sections, a control room or bridge at the front, a navigation room at the center, and an observation room or lounge used for relaxation and conferences at the back of the control gondola. The radio room was located within the hull along the Zeppelin's keel. The Hindenburg, like all other large Zeppelins before it, had four basic flight controls. The helmsman operated the airship's vertical control surfaces for changing course. A coxswain operated the elevator wheel off to the side, which controlled the airship's horizontal control surfaces to control the pitch. He was always limited to either 5 degrees up or down for the comfort of the passengers, as well as the fact angles greater than 8 degrees could cause cups and glasses to slide off tables. The airship often cruised around 200 meters of altitude, or lower to avoid clouds. It was also a fundamental premise of Zeppelin operations taught by Hugo Ekener that ships should avoid traveling close to their pressure height, because of the possibility of ascending above pressure height and valving hydrogen, which always presented a certain risk of fire, especially in electrically charged environments. An engine telegram was linked to each of the control cars so engine speed could be changed. Normal cruise was 125 km an hour, or approximately 67 knots. A mechanic in each car had to manually adjust the engines based on these commands as well as reverse the engines if ordered. The LZ-129 had four forward speeds. Idle, slow, half and cruise. And two reverse speeds, idle and full. A control board with toggle poles operated the ballast and gas cells to adjust the airship's static equilibrium in the air by either venting lifting gas from the top of the airship or by releasing water ballast from tanks in the airship's belly. While Hindenburg usually began a transatlantic flight with its full capacity of slightly more than 7 million cubic feet of hydrogen, it usually landed with between 5 and 6 million cubic feet of gas remaining in its cells. Hindenburg's watch officers attempted to keep the ship from flying more than 3 degrees heavy or 2 degrees light, and the ship was generally flown within a half degree of static equilibrium, valving hydrogen during flight was an important part of that process. The officers paid considerable attention to keeping the ship in equilibrium to avoid the need for steep angles of pitch, which would disturb the passengers, decrease speed, increase fuel consumption, and strain the ship. Having a level ship with full elevator control in both directions also made it safer to fly at lower altitudes, and since Hindenburg frequently flew only a few hundred feet above the surface, to stay under clouds and observe weather conditions in the ship's path, it was considered especially important to keep the ship in static equilibrium and Hugo Ekener had long warned airshipmen of the danger of driving a ship dynamically to death, that is, to demand so much of her dynamically that in the event of a stoppage of the motors the static resources will not suffice to keep her airborne. Since an airship becomes lighter as it burns fuel during flight, in order to maintain static equilibrium it is necessary either to generate additional ballast or to release lifting gas. Hindenburg's engines were not equipped with water recovery equipment, to create water from engine exhaust, and the ship's system of rain gutters did not provide a reliable supply of ballast. Without a dependable source of additional ballast, gas was valved freely to maintain equilibrium, and the ship routinely valved up to 1.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen during a North Atlantic crossing. Hindenburg's liberal valving of hydrogen to maintain level trim required the addition of about 20% fresh hydrogen every 7 to 10 days, which increased operational expenses, but had the benefit of maintaining the ship's lifting gas at a high level of purity. Maintaining a high level of purity, in other words, avoiding contamination of hydrogen by air, was an important safety feature in dealing with the flammable gas, pure hydrogen is difficult to ignite, but hydrogen mixed with air is highly volatile, so the purity of the gas was closely monitored. The gondola contained a number of instruments including a gyro compass, a magnetic compass, 
control surface deflection pointers with up to 20 degrees of allowed control deflection, pitch inclinometers, thermometers, indicating ambient air temperature and the temperature in gas cells 5 and 13. Thermohydrometer, indicating air temperature, relative humidity, and absolute humidity, a statoscope, indicating changes in barometric pressure, and thus altitude, a vertical speed indicator indicating the ship's rate of climb or descent, an altimeter, and a clock, as well as water ballast levels and gas pressures for each of the 16 gas cells. The Hindenburg even had a sonic altimeter to show the airship's height above ground level. The Hindenburg was equipped with an autopilot, which used the gyroscopic compass to control the rudder and elevators and keep the ship on its assigned course and altitude during a cruise in stable weather. The Anschutz automatic pilot system, after some initial adjustments, was accurate and effective, and in smooth weather it could hold a straighter course, and with application of smaller rudder angles, usually less than 3 degrees, than could be done by an experienced helmsman. When calm conditions prevailed, the autopilot sometimes remained engaged for as long as 40 hours. The Hindenburg was navigated from the navigation room, which contained work tables for the officers, cases for charts and maps, and navigation equipment including gyro compass repeaters, an optical drift indicator and radio direction finding equipment. In addition to equipment relating strictly to navigation, the navigation room also housed a 14-station telephone with connections to various stations around the ship, controls and indicators for the control car landing wheel and spider lines, and a pneumatic tube to convey messages between the control car and the radio room along the keel. There were no specific procedures limiting the rate or angle of rudder and elevator deflection. While there was a general understanding among the crew that full rudder and elevator inputs should be used judiciously, especially in rough air, the controls were sometimes put hard over as rapidly as the wheels could be spun. Sharp turns were occasionally made without significant concern for possible strain on the ship, and rudder angles up to and exceeding 15 degrees were observed. The elevators were also frequently put hard over when necessary to keep the ship level, and Hindenburg's officers believed, perhaps erroneously, that steep angles of pitch placed more strain on the ship than the hard maneuvering sometimes required to avoid them. No flight or operations manual exists for the Hindenburg, and neither the German Zeppelin Transport Company, which operated the Hindenburg, nor the Zeppelin Construction Company which built the Hindenburg and built and operated the Graf Zeppelin, ever prepared a manual for operational or training purposes. There was no formal ground school for flight personnel, and all training was done by the apprentice method. An operations manual was not really needed by the flight personnel of the Hindenburg, since most of the officers and crew had been flying on zeppelins for decades. Training was all done hands-on, with new crew members learning their jobs from experienced hands. And the Hindenburg was also, in many ways, an experimental aircraft, it was the first in its proposed class, and was used as a flying laboratory for the development and testing of both equipment and procedures. If the planned expansion of the Zeppelin fleet had taken place, more formalized training and reference materials would have been required, based on lessons learned from the Hindenburg. Crew and Passengers The interior spaces of the airship were divided into three major areas. The passenger decks, the control car, and the crew areas, which included the maintenance sections within the airship's hull and the engine cars. The passengers' quarters aboard the Hindenburg were contained within the Zeppelin's hull, unlike older airships like the LZ-127 that had the passenger quarters inside the control gondola. The passenger area had two decks known as A deck and B deck. The A deck contained the ship's dining room, lounge, writing room, port, and starboard promenades, and 25 double berth inside cabins. The passenger accommodations were decorated in the clean, modern design of principal architect Professor Fritz August Brewhaus. Passenger areas on the Hindenburg were heated, using forced air warmed by water from the cooling systems of the forward engines. Hindenburg's dining room occupied the entire length of the port side of A deck. It measured approximately 47 feet in length by 13 feet in width and was decorated with paintings on silk wallpaper by Professor Otto Arpka, depicting scenes from Graf Zeppelin's flights to South America. The tables and chairs were designed by Professor Fritz August Bruhaus using lightweight tubular aluminum, with the chairs upholstered in red. On the starboard side of a deck were the passenger lounge and writing room. The lounge was approximately 34 feet in length and was decorated with a mural depicting the routes and ships of the explorers Ferdinand Magellan, Captain Cook, Vasco da Gama, and Christopher Columbus, the transatlantic crossing of LZ-126 USS Los Angeles, the round-the-world flight and South American crossings of LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin, and the North Atlantic tracks of the great German ocean liners Bremen and Europa. The furniture, like that in the dining room, 
was designed in lightweight aluminum, but the chairs were upholstered in brown. During the 1936 season, the lounge contained a 356-pound baby grand piano, made of duralumin and covered with yellow pigskin. The piano was removed before the 1937 season and was not aboard Hindenburg during its last flight. Next to the lounge was a small writing room. The Hindenburg was originally built with 25 double berth cabins at the center of a deck, accommodating 50 passengers. After the ship's inaugural 1936 season, nine more cabins were added to B deck, accommodating an additional 20 passengers. The A deck cabins were small but were comparable to railroad sleeper compartments of the day. The cabins measured approximately 78 inches by 66 inches, and the walls and doors were made of a thin layer of lightweight foam covered by fabric. Cabins were decorated in one of three color schemes either light blue, gray, or beige and each A-deck cabin had one lower berth which was fixed in place, and one upper berth which could be folded against the wall during the day. Each cabin had call buttons to summon a steward or stewardess, a small fold-down desk, a wash basin made of lightweight white plastic with taps for hot and cold running water, and a small closet covered with a curtain in which a limited number of suits or dresses could be hung, other clothes had to be kept in their suitcases, which could be stowed under the lower berth. None of the cabins had toilet facilities. Male and female toilets were available on B-deck below, as was a single shower, which provided a weak stream of water. Because the A-deck cabins were located in the center of the ship, they had no windows, which was a feature missed by passengers who had traveled on Graf Zeppelin and had enjoyed the view of the passing scenery from their berths. On either side of A-deck were promenades, featuring seating areas and large windows which could be opened in flight. B-deck on the LZ-129, located directly below a deck, contained the ship's kitchen, passenger toilet, and shower facilities, the crew and officers' mess, and a cabin occupied by the chief steward, which contained a door to the keel corridor, which was the only connection between passenger and crew spaces. Perhaps most surprising aboard a hydrogen airship, there was also a smoking room on the Hindenburg. The smoking room was kept at higher than ambient pressure so that no leaking hydrogen could enter the room, and the smoking room and its associated bar were separated from the rest of the ship by a double-door airlock. One electric lighter was provided, as no open flames were allowed aboard the ship. The smoking room was painted blue, with dark blue-gray leather furniture, and the walls were decorated with yellow pigskin and illustrations by Otto Arpka depicting the history of lighter-than-air flight from the Montgolfiers' as balloon to the Graf Zeppelin. Along one side of the room was a railing above sealed windows, through which passengers could look down on the ocean or landscape passing below. The smoking room was perhaps the most popular public room on the ship, which is not surprising in an era in which so many people smoked. Sister Ship There were two Hindenburg-class Zeppelin airships built. The LZ-129 Hindenburg, which flew between 1936 and 1937. And the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin II, which flew between 1938 and 1939 without incident before being dismantled. There was very little difference between the two airships, except that the Graf Zeppelin II used a different engine car configuration, with more streamlined cars and propellers in the tractor configuration instead of a pusher configuration. The tail fins on the LZ-130 were 60 cm shorter and had a slightly different shape. The internal riveted framework was also configured slightly differently. Three-blade, variable pitch propellers were also used on the Graf Zeppelin II, while the Hindenburg only had fixed pitch, four-blade propellers. The gas cells of the Graf Zeppelin II also used lighter silk instead of the Hindenburg's cotton gas cells. The passenger decks were also completely redesigned to accommodate 40 passengers, compared to the Hindenburg 72. The Graf Zeppelin II would make a total of 30 flights without incident.